Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Stickler for the Details. My name is known in some wargaming circles as Stickler, and uh, I'm going to uh, make a second bite of the cherry, second attempt to um, film this episode on weather in flat top, uh, how it's used, what its effects are on the game, etc. I'm going to try and get it into a shorter segment than uh, previously. So, um, okay, weather. Weather is um, a big element in Flattop and how the game progresses. So I'm going to talk about uh, how weather is determined, uh, how it moves and changes during the game, and then finally um, we're going to talk about uh, the effects of clouds and storms on search and movement. Okay, so let's first start with uh, cloud and storm placement and movement. Now, when you start a scenario of flat top, the map, as you can see here, is broken up into quadrants or just areas of the map. And here we have eight of them covering the entire uh, Solomon Islands, New Guinea area. Some maps might only have, say, six of these or even four in some cases. But the... Each game is given a, a weather profile, and that is either cloud front, as you can see here, where all the groups of clouds are kind of banked in a front of clouds here, or the profile will be for scattered clouds. And first, let me show you uh, how you determine the starting position for these uh, cloud fronts, and then we'll move into what happens to decide um, the starting position of clouds and storms for uh, scattered for scattered clouds. Okay, let's zoom in here to this quadrant. When you start a scenario with uh, cloud fronts, as you can see here, the you get three cloud markers and these affect the hex they're in and in a radius of two hexes in all directions and you set these up separated by five hexes so that they form this line along the uh, two five directional then you roll one dice and move all of the uh, cloud markers together in the direction of the wind, indicated here by this directional marker, in that direction by a number according to one die roll, six, six-sided die roll. So to move this one to, uh, before the start of the game, you first roll the dice, and we roll a three. And so we take all of these and move them in the direction of the wind, three hexes, and that's where the clouds start off. Then you will do that, move that, uh, make that movement for each of these eight map quadrants. Now, if the game or the scenario has scattered clouds, and the majority of them actually do, what you do is you start with, I believe, four? Let's see. Yes, you actually start with four of these. Let's see if I can clone this. Yes, I can clone it. Okay, you start with four of these. And you place them in the hex where the directional 
marker is clumped. Then for each one of them, now according to the rules, what you do is you roll one die and you move the cloud marker in the direction of the die and also the number of hexes. So in this case, we would roll a die and that's a six. So let me zoom in a little bit so you can see better. Direction six is here to the northwest and one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you go to the next one and you roll another die and we rolled a two that time. So two in this direction. And then the third one, we would move five, one, two, three, four, five in this direction. And finally, this one, we would move one in this direction. Okay, so move our wind direction back here into the center of the directional. And this is our scattered clouds. Now, as you can see, here in this area, we have overlaps of two or more clouds. This indicates a storm, and this has greater effects on gameplay. The effects uh, of storms on gameplay are that um, if a task force is in a storm hex, and let's see... We'll just move the Japanese fleet in here and unmark them as moved. They cannot conduct any operations. So they cannot launch or recover aircraft, and the cap uh, has to be brought down. And you, you do get a, a free opportunity to uh, move or to, to land the cap. You're not – you don't have to uh, – lose everything in that hex. And the, the reason this would happen is that um, at two-hour and four-hour intervals, the clouds will move in the direction of the wind. We'll get to that a little bit later. So it is possible that you could uh, start a task force here to begin a turn. Um, and then the clouds during a movement phase or a cloud movement phase would move in the direction of the wind and place you in a different weather condition, being a storm. So if they actually move this way, all of a sudden now this task force is in a storm, and so the storm rules would, would uh, take effect. Now... The problem that I have with the scattered clouds um, determination is that when you base the both the direction and the number of hexes moved on one die roll, you will often end up with um, these tidy two hex radius storms overlap. So if you, if you roll a two, um, twice while you're determining the direction, then both of them will land up here in hex L11, and you'll get this storm. Then if you have any that have uh, three hexes, three, then they'll all end up, say, here. Whoops. That's not the one I wanted to move. There we go. So... One of the house rules that I employ is that for each cloud marker, when you're determining scattered clouds, you roll twice, once for direction and once for number of hexes. I think that makes for um, a better experience. Okay, so that is how uh, clouds and storms are pla placed. Now let's get into movement. After you determine... Um, the initial position of clouds and, and or storm fronts. What happens then is, let's see, let's get the time record. Okay, as you can see, here's the uh, error record sheet where you keep track of your error 
fleets and what they're doing, you'll notice there's also a uh, time band here. And so each turn represents an hour, and you move this down as the day progresses. Now, when it comes to clouds on even-numbered turns, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, etc. Clouds will move in the direction of the wind. So, provided the direction of the wind doesn't change, they will drift. Uh, clouds in this sector will drift in the three direction, one hex every two hours. Now, there's an additional wrinkle that every four hours, so I believe at uh, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, noon, etc., you roll to determine whether the wind in each quadrant changes direction. And that is determined also by a single die roll where 1 through 4 indicates no change in direction. If you roll a 5, then the wind shifts in the counterclockwise direction. If you roll a 6, it rotates in the clockwise direction. So that would be there. And then you shift the clouds. So in this way, uh, clouds can you know, add a little bit of uh, drama and uncertainty to things. Also, uh, if you get a cloud marker that kind of moves into the cusp of two zones, then it becomes necessary for you to determine which zone's wind influence is going to affect it. And there is a optional rule, is it? Where is it? There's a tables cloud movement. There you go. Right here, the cloud movement table, you roll yet another die. And if you roll a one, then the, the cloud stays in the same sector that it originally was in. If you roll a two to five, you determine that the cloud has uh, moved to the new sector. And turn six, uh, I'm not sure what sector I means. Um, yeah, that one I'm not sure. Hmm. We'll have to check on that and see what goes on with that. Now, let's now talk about text on search and observation. During uh, gameplay, the players will be moving around their task forces and they may or may not be uh, visible to the other player on the map. Um, for purposes of this demonstration, I'm just going to uh, freely move both sides' forces, and I'm going to have to switch sides to even be able to uh, access them. So right now I'm playing as the uh, Japanese player, and as you can see, I cannot move the American uh, task force or air fleet markers. So as you move your forces around and launch planes and conduct searches, you start to move them around the map. And let's say we've got an American task force here, and we've got some planes that are taking off from that and moving around. Okay, let's say the Japanese player has a uh, flight of the usual float planes here, and they have reason to suggest that the Americans might be hiding in this uh, cloudy area trying to avoid detection. So let's, let's assume for... Uh, our purposes that the these American 
forces are actually not deployed on the map where the Japanese can see them. Now, because they are in cloud hexes, this will affect the uh, search results that the Japanese player can attain. So uh, to kind of get ahead of ourselves and paraphrase the way search is conducted, when a player is uh, moving aircraft and, and doing observation, they first roll a die to determine whether or not any searches they undertake uh, during the current turn will be successful. In clear weather, so that's when the aircraft starts in a clear weather hex, you will successfully observe anything on a one through four with a five and six being unsuccessful. So first you would state, okay, this uh, air fleet is going to be searching and then you roll a die and as you can see i rolled a two that means that its search will be successful then you actually move it and let's say it'll go one two three four five Now, as the Japanese player is moving this marker, if at any point he gets close enough to get a certain search condition, the U.S. player is obligated to tell the searching Japanese player that something is uh, located in a hex that you pass close to in proximity. Now, because the Americans are themselves in a cloud hex, see how that affects what they're able to see. On the observation tables here, we have an air formation here as the observing unit. We have a, a air formation as a unit being observed here, and the weather for the hex being observed is clouds, you can see that you have to get within one hex or adjacent before you get a result of one, which is to say condition one is you see planes. If this were in clear, a air formation spotting an air formation that got within range one or adjacent in a clear hex, the condition would be two. And that is, they would be told how many air formations that, that they spotted, and they can pad or decrease the number that they tell you in terms of uh, formations by 50%. So if there are two formations there, they could say one, or they could say three, etc. And they also have to tell you whether they are armed or unarmed planes. So armed planes are bombers, obviously. Unarmed planes are bombers not carrying bombs, or fighters, interceptors. So you can see the presence of clouds will reduce the uh, observation reporting requirements by one. Also, if the searching aircraft begins its phase as it does here in a cloud hex, that initial roll that you make is increased by one. So if it starts here and a clear hex is one through four, 
they're successful, five or six that are not successful. If they start here, it's one through three successful, four, five, or six unsuccessful. So as you can see, clouds have a detrimental effect on search, both in terms of what has to be reported, the proximity of which a searching um, air formation has to be, and in terms of uh, the quality of the report. Okay, now I, you'll remember uh, we talked about um, storms. If we have this condition here, and let's say we can move our wind direction here. If this were the position of these aircraft at the beginning or at the end of a given turn, and we get to the next turn, and it's a even number hour, which means that the clouds will at least move in the direction of the wind. And then this formation moves here. Now all of a sudden you've got the American task force and this air formation within a storm. They can't be, they cannot be there. And so what the rule state is that you have to uh, move the air formation by the most expedient route out of that storm. So they could go, hang on a second, let me, let me switch sides here and go to USA. Okay. They could go this way, or they could go this way, or they could go this way, but they wouldn't go, say, this one to try and circumvent that unit that they might actually uh, realize is there. They can't take that. They have to take the most circuitous route out of the storm, or I'm sorry, the most direct route out of the storm as is possible. The task force, however, could stay within the storm if it wanted to, but its, uh, its ability to launch or uh, to recover aircraft is eliminated. And I believe even um, that it affects the movement rate. Let's see here. Um, if a task force enters a storm hex during movement, it must stop and move no further in that turn. If a task force begins a turn in a storm hex, it can't move. Its movement factor is zero for that turn. So if a task force actually gets caught within a storm, it's it pretty much has to stay there until the storm passes over. So in this case, this task force is really, really in trouble because the wind direction is... Um, to the southeast and at a rate of possibly only one dr uh, one hex of drift every two turns, we're talking to whoops, to four six eight turns that they're going to have to stay there until the storm blows over. During those eight turns, there might be one or two chances for the wind to change direction, which could, you know, it could move this way and then move that way, and then it's trapped in that storm. So, word of uh, caution, you may want to make sure that, you know, you mind the meteorologist report and uh, stay clear of storms that are approaching you. Okay, I think that
pretty much covers the effects of uh, weather, clouds, uh, and storms on play and flat top. Uh, I don't think I was successful in cutting down the length of this uh, demo, but I think I covered more in this one than I did in the previous one. So we'll call it good. And thank you for tuning in. This has been Stigler for the details, and we will see you next time.